Truly California is a KQED production presented in association with the Bay Area Video Coalition and San Francisco Film Society. Next on Truly California. On April 18, 1906, a massive earthquake struck Northern California. Within 72 hours, San Francisco, the Paris of the Pacific, was gone. Everyone was well-intentioned, but there were inexperienced people basically doing things that only added to the confusion and to the chaos. Human courage and political incompetence. Next, in the damnedest, finest ruins. Support for Truly California is provided by the KQED Campaign for the Future Program Venture Fund and the members of KQED. In 1894, a 21-year-old tenor made his singing debut at the Naples Opera House, several blocks from where he was born. He had sung on street corners and in churches to pay for his formal training. But the haughty Naples Opera crowd was unimpressed by the poor neighborhood boy. He was so angry over his hostile reception that he swore never to perform in his own hometown again. It would be their loss. In a few short years, Enrico Caruso would become the most famous entertainer in the world. His voice was so powerful, and yet so tender and expressive, audiences would sometimes burst into applause in mid-performance. In April of 1906, the great Caruso boarded a train for San Francisco in what was to be a crowning moment for the city known as the Paris of the Pacific. But Caruso had been so wary of the city's Wild West reputation, he bought a revolver and practiced his quick draw off the back of the train.
In three terrible days in April of 1906, the jewel of the American West would be wiped from the face of the earth. In the spring of 1906, San Francisco had earned its reputation as the Paris of the Pacific. No city anywhere had ever grown so fast, so rich, so powerful in so short a time. At one point, 17 cable car lines climbed up and down its fabled hills. Thirty-seven national banks, three opera houses, a thriving arts, music, and theater community. The nation changed more in the 20 years preceding the new century than it had in all of human history. The years between 1880 and the 1906 earthquake saw the invention of the automobile, the phonograph record, the X-ray machine, and the airplane. The suffragist movement, the labor movement, the campaign to end child labor all gained enormous momentum. John Muir founded the Sierra Club to preserve the West's extraordinary beauty, finding a friend and ally in Theodore Roosevelt. America was transformed from a rural into an urban society, as the new technology and jobs drew people to cities by the millions. American cities were straining at the seams under the explosive growth and San Francisco was the most powerful magnet in the American West. Golden Gate Park, the nation's largest municipal park, boasted a million trees and plants from every country on Earth except Peru. Ferry boats plied the deep blue waters of San Francisco Bay, carrying five million passengers a year. A booming waterfront handled cargo and shipping that rivaled New York. One quarter of the entire population west of the Rocky Mountains lived within 50 miles of its famed city hall, the most imposing Beaux-Arts structure in the nation. Upon his arrival at San Francisco's picturesque ferry plaza, the famed tenor was asked if he feared San Francisco's infamous earthquakes. But Mount Vesuvius had just erupted in Italy, threatening his hometown of Naples. Vesuvius is the most frightening thing of all, he replied, adding that God had sent him to San Francisco to be safe. On May 12, 1848, a general store owner named Sam Brannan walked through the city's streets shouting, gold, gold in the American River. San Francisco's Golden Gate was the Ellis Island of the West. 
it was really the uh, the second coming of the American dream. It reinvigorated the American dream. It was the foundation, the wellspring of the Western migration, and it was uh, it was a hell of a migration. Seven hundred ships passed through the Golden Gate in 1849 alone. For 18 months, San Francisco's population doubled every 10 days. Across the nation, carpenters left houses unfinished. Farmers' fields went unplowed. Young women were abandoned days from the altar. Cowboys from Mexico, gamblers from New Orleans, lawyers from Boston, all fled for the gold fields. The gold rush would spawn a dozen empires. A shop owner named Levi Strauss made pants from tent canvas, dyed them blue, and sold his blue jeans to miners desperate for durable britches, triggering a fashion revolution. Wells Fargo was formed to store and assay gold. Money begat money. The gold barons, led by Governor Leland Stanford, masterminded the Transcontinental Railroad. They united an entire nation at Promontory Point, Utah, in May of 1869. The Western migration did not slack. It quickened. San Francisco was attractive first for the money. From throughout the world, they came because they wanted to better themselves. The city also offered a way of escaping. But the city's nonstop growth and building boom came with a deadly price. Well before 1906, there were many, many significant fires, six major fires that literally almost swept San Francisco from the map. Earthquakes in 1865 and 1868 produced San Francisco's first fatalities and the city always successfully hid their problems and rebuilt. The money kept flowing. The city kept growing. San Francisco had become the wealthiest city per capita in the nation. Carpenters, bricklayers, waiters, and bartenders earned the highest wages in the nation. The city's freewheeling spirit fueled an explosion in art literature, theater, and recreation. A newspaper reporter from the Californian borrowed the name of a San Francisco firefighter named Tom Sawyer and created a new form of American literature. The author, Samuel Clemens, also borrowed a name for himself, Mark Twain. And then there was Jack London. At 14, he was the king of the oyster pirates on San Francisco Bay. He ran for mayor of Oakland on the socialist ticket he would become a worldwide icon of the progressive movement and perhaps the most influential American writer of all. But exploding urban growth led to a multitude of evils, congestion, organized crime, and the emergence of the political boss. San Francisco's boss Abe Roof controlled the mayor's office and all of the city's 18 supervisors. Mayor Eugene Schmitz was a former orchestra conductor whose greatest skill was lining his pockets. One pundit observed, his smile wouldn't fade if his mother was on fire. And then there was the little general, Frederick Funston, barely five feet three. Mayor Schmitz and uh, General Funston painted themselves as the heroes of the 1906 earthquake, rallying the city in its darkest hour, keeping order amidst the chaos. Virtually every contemporary historian uh, now believes otherwise. Finally, there was the fire chief, Dennis Sullivan. For more than a decade, he had begged the city leaders to build the most radical and comprehensive fire suppression system the world had ever seen. He was very loud and clear, uh, sometimes unpopular because he was so emphatic about his ideas uh, that in a way really felt, fell on deaf ears. A high pressure hydrant system with a fire boat to have pumping stations with the ability to draw salt water from the bay. The 1906 earthquake, and particularly the fire, are partially attributable to nature's wrath. The rest of it, unfortunately, the majority of it, uh, can be laid at the feet of mankind's infinite stupidity. 
As Enrico Caruso made his way from the ferry plaza to the legendary Palace Hotel, a political firestorm was already mounting. San Francisco's two political leaders, Mayor Eugene Smits and boss Abe Roof, were about to be indicted in the biggest corruption probe in U.S. history. On the night of April 17th, Caruso delivered a stunning performance as Carmen's love-struck suitor, Don Jose. The Grand Opera crowd showered him with five curtain calls. Fire Chief Dennis Sullivan returned to his station near Chinatown after battling an enormous blaze near Fisherman's Wharf. Mayor Eugene Schmitz and political boss Abe Roof must have slept uneasily, troubled by their imminent arrests. Just after 5 a.m., that's when it hit. One hundred twenty-five miles north of San Francisco, the Point Arena Lighthouse, a hundred and ten feet high, cracked like a whip, shattering the massive lantern which had withstood near gale force winds. Shock waves tore through Mendocino and Sonoma counties, slamming buildings from their foundations, bending a wooden bridge like a giant toothpick. starting landslides, snapping off giant redwood trees hundreds of years old. It smashed the coastal town of Fort Bragg, shattered a church at Fort Ross. The massive tremors traveled east across the High Sierra, rattling windows in Nevada, and then north, frightening horses and citizens in Portland, Oregon. The rip tore through the center of banana-shaped Tomales Bay, moving the western leg 18 feet further north. At Point Reyes, 30 miles north of San Francisco, in the dim light of daybreak, a railroad fireman prepared his engine for the commute into San Francisco. The tremor tossed the engine and four cars into the air where it landed in a poppy field. As the shock waves tore toward San Francisco, military prisoners on Alcatraz slept undisturbed on the solid rock. People walking home after an evening of post-Caruso festivities heard a deep rumble as the earth began to tremble beneath them. Hundreds were knocked to the ground, unable to move as if pinned by a giant hand. Buildings swayed in circles like drunken hula dancers. Trolley tracks and cable car slots twisted like putty. Electric lines snapped and hissed, flashing blue and white sparks against the blue-gray dawn. An avalanche of brick and stone facades tumbled to the ground. The sound was deafening. In the produce district, men and horses were buried beneath falling rubble. In the mission district, Mexican vaqueros and the steers they were herding to the slaughterhouse were knocked from their feet. In the congested tenements and boarding houses south of Market Street, Roofs and floors collapsed, trapping thousands. Along the high-rises in the broad Market Street corridor, the air was split by the metallic shriek of steel girders twisting and straining against each other.
Cobblestone streets cracked and danced like popcorn. Millions of wooden floor joists and ceiling rafters and redwood posts and beams creaked and groaned with the sound of 10,000 packing crates being pried open simultaneously. In the residential districts and along the city's hills, its colorful Victorians were rocked from their foundations, slamming into each other like rows of enormous dominoes. Chimneys and cornices snapped at their bases, crashing through rooftops as though they were paper. The city's fabled hills undulated like roller coasters, shedding sidewalks and fire hydrants. I always laugh when someone says San Francisco's earthquake. It was not San Francisco's earthquake. We shared it with a great part of the state of California. The rip tore south through the San Francisco Peninsula. At majestic Stanford University, it reduced 14 buildings to dust, killing two inhabitants. Directly in the Tembler's path lay San Jose. Block after block of brick and adobe buildings tumbled to the ground. Nearby, Agnew's State Insane Asylum was slammed. Over 100 people were killed. 50 miles south, a sawmill was buried by the hill behind it, killing nine men. The rip slammed the old mission of San Juan Batista, 275 miles from its northernmost victim at Point Arena. For a long moment, silence lingered throughout San Francisco, save for the frenetic clanging of church bells as though signaling the city's impending doom. The entire event had lasted 53 seconds. The sound was quickly followed by the thunder of walls and buildings smashing onto city streets, sending a cloud of choking dust into the thin rays of the morning sunrise. The populace of San Francisco began to spill into the street. All were stunned, silent, stricken mute by the scope and swiftness of the disaster. Little did they know the worst was about to begin. The one man best prepared to defend the city Fire Chief Dennis Sullivan, the man who had prepared his entire life for that moment, was among the earthquake's first victims. Dennis Sullivan, he had significant injuries that he sustained uh, when an ornamental piece from the California Hotel crashed through his dwelling. A steeple from the California Hotel next door cut Dennis Sullivan's fire station in half. He could hear his wife, Margaret, screaming for help from the back bedroom. He was blinded by dust and uh, unaware of the chasm that lay before him, and he fell four stories into the basement of his fire station. Fractured skull, several broken ribs, scalded over 60% of his body from steam from the boiler in his basement. I believe the loss of Dennis Sullivan immediately after the earthquake, the leader that everyone looked to, it was a tremendous loss for the fire department and for the city as a whole. Now with Dennis Sullivan mortally wounded, Control fell to a man with no understanding and no interest in disaster preparation or management, Mayor Eugene Schmitz. When Mayor Schmitz arrived at City Hall, only then did he realize the magnitude of the disaster. Schmitz would soon abdicate authority to another man, Brigadier General Frederick Funston. Frederick Funston sent a messenger to the Presidio 
to order Colonel Morris, the duty officer, to muster his troops into the city. Morris refused. He told the messenger, tell Funston to look up his army regulations. Uh, only the President of the United States and the governor could order federal troops into a city. Funston did it anyway. Everyone was well-intentioned, but there were inexperienced people basically doing things that only added to the confusion and to the chaos and to the fires. From my research, there was about 52 fires that broke out just after the earthquake. Fires started immediately. The chimneys went down, the fires started in those chimneys. Schmitz drove in a Pierce Arrow automobile toward North Beach to establish a command post at the Hall of Justice. A nightmare scene unfolded around the city. The moans and shrieks of wounded could be heard as rescuers clawed through shattered buildings to reach them. Mayor Schmitz counted a dozen plumes of smoke, mostly from the congested tenement district south of Market Street. When he arrived at the Hall of Justice, scores of people were already gathered, pleading for help in rescuing their loved ones. Schmitz learned the man he needed most, Dennis Sullivan, had been gravely wounded. The fire department's entire alarm system had been shattered, the city's firehouses badly damaged. In the 53 seconds the earthquake lasted, one of the nation's most skilled fire departments had been delivered one crippling blow after another. When Funston's troops arrived at the Hall of Justice, Mayor Schmitz issued several orders that would prove catastrophic, decisions that haunt San Francisco's history to this day. Within minutes, Funston's young soldiers were deployed, virtually all of them without oversight or a chain of command. Well, they forgot the law part when they imposed order. Uh, there were hundreds of soldiers who got drunk on the job, looted stores, uh, shot innocent people uh, as suspected looters. Mayor Schmidt soon decided to enlist 1,000 special police to help the soldiers and regular police forces. There are uh, several very well-known cases of innocent people being shot. There is a story of a man coming out of his house with a chicken in his hand and a soldier shot him in the back and killed him. Eber Tilden, he worked for the Red Cross to ferry uh, victims from disaster sites to hospitals. He drove through um, a military cordon with a Red Cross flag on the back, very large, prominently displayed shot and killed a guy who was a legitimate hero. Firefighters were working under near impossible conditions. The fire department had their communication system on Waverly Place, right across the street from the Hall of Justice in Chinatown. Across the city, firefighters had to chop their way out of their firehouses. Two of the three main water lines from the Spring Valley Water Company had ruptured. Beneath the city's broken streets, hundreds of other water lines lay twisted and useless. How many ways can you torture a great fire department? First, the worst earthquake in American history. Then you take their leader, shatter their firehouses, scatter their horses, start 52 fires in a matter of a few minutes and then take away the complete water supply. So what does the San Francisco Fire Department do? They fight back. As fires quickly spread, Eugene Schmitz handed control of the fire department to Deputy Chief John Dougherty. Dougherty is 68 years old. But with Sullivan gone, Schmitz makes the most momentous decision of the entire disaster. Dynamite, and lots of it. At the Palace Hotel, Enrico Caruso had survived. The palace had undulated in a giant circle, but its thick walls and tons of iron reinforcing bands had performed perfectly. He walked several blocks to the St. Francis Hotel, where he ate a sumptuous breakfast, muttering, Hell of a place, I never sing it again. Near the famed Mission Dolores, the four-story Valencia Street Hotel had sunk into an old creek. A ruptured water main helped turn the soil beneath it to mush. More than 40 people 
drowned. 45 miles north, Santa Rosa was being ravished by fire. 45 miles south at Agnew State Hospital, escaped mental patients run about the hospital's grounds, naked and hysterical. Sheriff's deputies lasso and tie them to trees, but the disaster's ground zero is in the dense tenements area south of Market Street. On 6th Street, four cheap residence hotels have collapsed, four hotels with more than a 1,000 small rooms. Captain Charles Cullen and his men managed to drag their heavy brass Jones and Clapp steam engine to the street, only to find the hydrants were dry. Cullen's men managed to pull two victims from the wreckage before fire swept the entire block. As many as 500 may have died in one city block. Firefighters are resourceful people. They form bucket brigades, they use sand, they dipped their hoses into the Pacific Ocean, into sewers. They did everything they could to fight that fire and defend the city of San Francisco. At first, dynamite was used by desperate firefighters. Then the military took over. They used granulated dynamite, black powder, gun cotton, the most flammable substances known to humankind. By the afternoon of April 18th, the stream of refugees headed toward the ferry building and waterfront has become a desperate torrent. But help was on the way. Lieutenant Frederick Freeman, commander of the USS Preble, steamed toward the city from Mare Island on San Francisco Bay. The Navy would help the city's firefighters save the Southern Pacific Railroad yards. The victory was crucial. Over the next three days, the Southern Pacific would haul more than 200,000 refugees to safety. While the Navy worked furiously to aid the efforts of city firefighters, General Funston's demolition teams dynamited so many buildings, it sounded like an artillery barrage. That debris started hundreds of other fires hastening the city's destruction. It was a war of opposites, the Navy and firefighters finding success wherever they could supply enough water, the Army blasting and burning the city in order to save it. Near City Hall, the infamous ham and eggs fire was started by a woman attempting to cook breakfast on a stove whose chimney was cracked. Among the most badly damaged facilities were San Francisco's hospitals, Rescuers used the mechanics pavilion as a makeshift facility. As fire approached the building, nurses and volunteers commandeered every available vehicle and evacuated more than 300 people, just as the building filled with smoke and flames. In Chinatown, an escaped bull was running wild, goring and trampling people. A police officer shot and killed it. Chinese people who believed the world was held up by four bulls and that the earthquake was caused by the escaped one having left its post wailed and moaned that the world was doomed. Many of the members in the fire department had virtually no contact with their loved ones and their families. You can only imagine how that weighed heavily on their mind. Many of them worked day in, day out for three straight days without really any breaks. And that to me is a true hero. The fires kept growing, spreading, building by building, aided by the dynamiting. The fire created its own draft, the chimney effect, sucking air from 360 degrees. By early afternoon of April 18th, all of south of Market Street was in flames. Sixty men at the United States Mint used a single hose and water from an artesian well to save millions in gold, crucial to the city's rebuilding. A few blocks away on Market Street, people stopped to stare at the Palace Hotel. The saying was, if the Palace goes, so goes San Francisco. All day, the Palace staff had used water from their six storage tanks to put out the sparks that rained down on the hotel. The fire department found there were 12 hydrants or hookups alongside the Palace Hotel. They hooked into those. They drain the reservoir water from the Palace Hotel. The Palace Hotel was the pride of San Francisco. 
Every American president from Grant to Roosevelt had stayed there. Sarah Bernhardt had stayed there with her entourage and a pet tiger. Um, they had scandalous affairs, marriages, they even had a murder there. Uh, when the fire burned through the Palace Hotel and left Market Street, it burned into the financial district in Chinatown. At 2.30 in the afternoon, a gloom fell over San Francisco. Any hope the city might survive perished in the flames of the Palace Hotel. By late afternoon, with the fire eating through the financial district, dynamite teams hastened their disastrous efforts. On California Street, Army Lieutenant Martin Briggs and his team blew up a building that ignited another fire a block away. They started over a dozen more fires. People were being shot for any suspected infraction. One of the disaster's greatest photographers was J.B. Monaco, an Italian immigrant who opened one of the city's first photography studios. Well, my grandfather, J.B. Monaco, was bitter to the day he died at the fact that the federal troops would not let him into the studio to save the whole photographic history. It was, a great, it, it was not only a great personal loss, it, it, it was, certainly was a, an historic loss. But J.B. Monaco would produce some of the disaster's most memorable images. This is, uh, this is the, the fire sweeping up Kearney Street, and in, in the distance is the earthquake-damaged Hall of Justice. Uh, this picture was taken within an hour of the time that the fire reached my grandfather's studio. Just take a look at those flames and the disaster that's in the background of the, uh, of the picture sweeping down, and it's going to destroy everything in its path. J.B. Monaco, though he had lost his business in an irreplaceable photographic history of San Francisco, would soon have a victory. There is the house that J.B. Monaco built in 1904. There was a natural well around the corner. They formed a bucket brigade from Francisco Street up to Leavenworth Street and fought the fire for roughly 18 hours, and the block was saved. What is most remarkable to me about the photograph is how that one block stands out, how that one block was saved, and look at all of the destruction around it. It's an absolute miracle. Despite having lost the studio, he still had a home. On fabled Telegraph Hill, Enrico Caruso, a talented sketch artist, calmly drew the fires below him. General Funston conferred with Mayor Eugene Schmitz and convinced him that the answer to the catastrophic use of dynamite was more dynamite. More dynamiting in an ever-widening arc around the entire core of the city. That night, the Hall of Justice succumbed to flames that had raced through the financial district and into Chinatown. Mayor Schmitz and his aides had moved to the Fairmont Hotel atop stately Knob Hill, which had been scheduled to open that very morning. Thousands of the newly homeless, too weary or frightened to compete with the throng shoving onto the trains and ferries, collapsed in the city's parks. 30,000 sprawled on the grounds of Golden Gate Park. Each carried the object they prized the most, a banjo, a frying pan, photo albums, an oil painting, pets of all shapes and colors. Many sported four and five layers of their best clothing. Their earlier calm had given way to weeping and hysteria. The entire nation paused as stories and rumors were spread by telegraph. Some escaping train passengers spread stories at every stop. The more outlandish the story, the more a reporter would pay. Ghouls were feasting on the bodies. Thieves were chewing off fingers and earlobes of the dead to get precious jewelry. California had slid into the ocean. E. H. Harriman of the Southern Pacific Railroad ordered all of his trains to speed supplies to the stricken city. In New York, William Randolph Hearst organized a massive relief effort. The city of Los Angeles gathered hundreds of thousands of dollars in relief supplies. In 14 hours, San Francisco's southern rival delivered the first relief train. While Frederick Funston increased the dynamiting and damage with almost maniacal fervor, 
another Funston worked with unerring calm. Ida Funston, the general's stately, attractive wife, took charge of relief efforts at the Presidio. A tent city was established, then a soup kitchen. The largest and most functional medical facility was the Presidio's Letterman Hospital. While making her rounds, Ida Funston encountered the stricken fire chief, Dennis Sullivan, clinging to life, oblivious to the chaos. As the fire spread through Chinatown, toward his refuge atop Telegraph Hill, Enrico Caruso moved again. He walked miles over the city's tortuous hills to Golden Gate Park. He would spend the night in a trolley car near the park, chatting with the trolley's conductors. The imposing Stanford Mansion, whose enormous entry sported the 12 signs of the zodiac in black marble, succumbed. Then the Crocker and Huntington mansions. The massive Fairmont Hotel caught fire at 5.30 a.m. on April 19th. In 15 minutes, the entire interior of the Fairmont, its high-ceilinged rooms, thousands of pieces of expensive furniture, incinerated. Its exterior, built from massive blocks of granite, was impervious. At the Presbyterian mission on the edge of Chinatown, Donaldina Cameron, who had devoted her life to rescuing Chinese girls from their enslavers, struggled to organize her frightened charges. The fire ravaged Chinatown and was about to leap Broadway, where it would likely burn through North Beach all the way to the waterfront. But the wind changed, sparing North Beach's Italian quarter, home to artists and writers. Instead, the mountainous flames ripped through the Barbary Coast, devouring the fancy brothels above the French restaurants. It consumed the Shanghaiing saloons known as deadfalls and blind pigs, gambling joints and boarding houses, places called Dead Man's Alley and Murder Point. On the waterfront, Navy Lieutenant Frederick Freeman, his deputy John Pond and Navy tugboats were still moving pier to pier, fighting desperately to keep the flames from spreading to the all-important docks. They saved the ferry building, crucial to the mounting evacuation. In an all-night battle, Freeman's tugboat pumped salt water through a single line to heroic firefighters, winning a crucial battle in the financial district. By the afternoon of April 19th, Army troops at the Presidio were performing flawlessly under a strict chain of command. In the city itself, there was a different story. Many other soldiers, National Guardsmen and Special Police, exhausted, dehydrated, some inebriated, continued their carnage. A storekeeper was bayoneted for charging 75 cents for bread. Another man was shot for refusing to join the fire line. A 15-year-old military cadet helping to clear a saloon was shot by a drunken soldier as he exited. Funston's men had expanded their demolition efforts to include cannons and artillery. They blasted away at houses on the east side of Van Ness Avenue. But no one wanted to challenge General Funston's authority. At Funston's command post at Fort Mason, Captain Levert Coleman proposed an audacious plan. Coleman wanted to dynamite a 50-foot trench half the length of Van Ness Avenue. Tons of explosives were already en route. At midday, Thursday, April 19th, with the city aflame for more than 30 hours, a welcome sight appeared at the mouth of the Golden Gate. Five ships of the U.S. Navy's Pacific Squadron. Over the next 30 hours, sailors, Marines, and volunteers would join hundreds of firefighters in two crucial fights. Most critical in the struggle was to save the waterfront, where thousands were seeking rescue by ferry, pleasure craft, rowboats, garbage scows. Market Street, south of Market, were gone. City Hall was gone. The Produce District, Financial District, Barbary Coast, Chinatown, all gone. Parts of Russian Hill and North Beach were gone. The greatest testimony to the insanity of the dynamite can be seen at the Viavi building on Van Ness and Green Street. The fire had already been extinguished in that area when soldiers blew it up uh, with dynamite. And that started the Russian Hill fire, which burned over into North Beach and was one of the most catastrophic fires. People ran uh, through the streets of North Beach. It created firestorms. 
It burned 50 square blocks that did not have to burn and may have killed hundreds of people. It is, it is the great testimony to the insanity of the dynamite, absolutely. A filthy and exhausted acting chief, John Dougherty, drove up and down Van Ness Avenue in a horse-drawn carriage. He screamed orders at his men, some of them weeping and delirious from dehydration and exhaustion. Doctors and nurses went along the fire lines, injecting firefighters with strychnine, believing it was a stimulant, antibiotic, and painkiller. Firefighters rallied for one more fight. For these men to keep going and going and going from one fire to the next, trying to make a difference, being creative, using anything they could to suppress the fires. Without sleep, they went without food, just to protect the, the citizens and the city. Amazing. With salt water pumped by the U.S. Navy, firefighters and volunteers and sailors and Marines kept the fire from leaping to the west side of Van Ness Avenue. Had they not stopped it there, it would have burned seven miles all the way to the Pacific Ocean, destroying what little was left of San Francisco. At every dock and pier along the waterfront, sailors and Marines held back the fire and executed the biggest naval evacuation in American history. The fire was so hot, the paint and shellac on their boats bubbled and melted. Baked and burned, the young men had to hose themselves down with salt water. Men collapsed and were dragged away. Others took their places on the fire line. Fearless engineers and stokers returned to the Southern Pacific Yards time after time, taking out more than 1,000 carloads of distraught refugees. Nuns and nurses turned ships into floating hospitals. In the Mission District, hundreds of citizens, firefighters, sailors, and soldiers used a single working hydrant to fight the fires. At 7.15 a.m., Saturday, April 21st, three days after the disaster struck, the fire burned itself out. It had consumed 29,000 buildings, 86% of the city's standing structures. Though the official death toll would report 478 dead, a lie that would stand for almost a century, the real toll has been estimated at more than 3,000. Some claim it was much higher. Every building on the waterfront survived, thanks to the astonishing effort of Frederick Freeman and his men, who stood the fire lines for 72 hours. Hundreds of San Francisco firefighters stayed the fight, even though most had lost their homes. The fire consumed 37 national banks, two opera houses, the entire financial center of the American West. The New York Stock Exchange would dip the next day, and a mild recession would sweep the nation from the loss of one of its great financial engines. The damage was estimated at $400 million, equal to the entire federal budget for the year.
Eugene Schmitz and Abe Roof would be indicted on massive corruption charges. Schmitz would get off on a technicality and several years later was elected to the Board of Supervisors. Abe Roof received a 14-year sentence and did four and a half years in San Quentin. Uh, the earthquake and fire actually did have somewhat of a cleansing effect. That level of wholesale corruption and, and uh, barbarity that still existed in San Francisco was wiped out uh, in, in many areas. It was a turning point, really, in San Francisco history. It is extremely important to reflect on history, to look at what went right, what went wrong, and to identify how one can do better. I like to say that if history teaches us anything, it's the fact that history rarely teaches us anything. I hope people find this story. I hope they see the drama and the courage and the, and the insanity and the beauty and all the extraordinary elements of this story. Uh, history is a, is a living thing. And I hope that drama comes through and I hope people discover this extraordinary city that is no more. Uh, and above all, I hope it speaks to us. I hope it teaches us a lesson because it is a lesson that we sorely need to learn. Dennis Sullivan would die 18 hours after the fire burned out, as though his soul was connected to the city, unable to depart his wounded body until the great issue was settled. In 1912, voters in San Francisco would approve the Sullivan Plan and build the world's most elaborate and expensive fire suppression system. Want more of Truly California? Visit our website to watch previews of upcoming films, sign up for our newsletter, and subscribe to the Truly California Shorts podcast. It's all at kqed.org slash trulyca. Support for Truly California is provided by the KQED Campaign for the Future Program Venture Fund and the members of KQED. Truly California is a KQED production presented in association with the Bay Area Video Coalition and San Francisco Film Society.